this is a podcast uh, <laughs> called the Mike Dicta Podcast. And with all good jokes, I think we should explain it uh, because <laughs> yeah, about right. 50% of the people we've told the name to uh, don't understand what it means. Uh, anyone want to take that one? Uh, no, no. Like I think, I think the, I think the uh, explanatory answer for uh, the name of our podcast is that we're all Bears fans. Yep, that's true. Big <laughs> that's, Bears. Fans. That's our, yeah. that's our origin story, which is as li- much of a lie as anything else. Well, when I posted um, the logo, um, somebody said, "Oh my God, you're doing a Bears podcast." I know everything <laughs> about the Bears. Can I be on? So. <laughs> Yeah, episode five. We'll have them on. All right. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about today right. is it's going to be it's going to be nothing but discussions of the uh, probate arguments over the Hallis estate. I was going to say, yeah, it's all going to be Chicago Bears themed legal arguments. Right. We're going to go over the the lease at Soldier Field. Uh... <laughs> the definition the definition of a catch. No, we're not getting into that. Yeah, uh, we don't have the answers. Listen, there's some things we can't handle. Hey everyone, welcome to uh, Mike Dicta, America's best named legal podcast. I am uh, your host, Charles Starr. I have with me three other co-hosts, because this is like any other socialist enterprise, uh, completely shared. Uh, I am a lawyer in New York, uh, who you may have heard on Jeb Lund's This Week in Atrocity, and on Twitter, at YouGarls. with me is first Tariq. Uh, Tariq, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm uh, Tariq. I am uh, uh, the <laughs> Second <laughs> Amendment Muslim. <laughs> right off the bat, right I probably should have been cleared up before <laughs> I started <laughs> introducing uh, you. Uh, I'm, I'm Tariq, I am uh, very forgiving, but people mispronouncing my name, which apparently... No, 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 no. Well, all no. This is, is this is this is this is. I was going to say Michael. I, I should say, people at work alternatively call me Tariq or Tarek. Uh, yeah, I know. My father, I mean... uh, when he was mad, would say Tariq, uh, and when he was uh, happy, would say Tarek. So uh, any of these are fine. Uh, but again, my, since I'm not angry, my name is Tarek. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, used to be the Second Amendment Muslim. Now I am the Hell Dude. I'm a lawyer in New York as well. Surprisingly. Uh, James? Sure. Uh, my name is James. I'm at JM LaRocca on Twitter. Uh, I am also a lawyer. You might be sensing a theme here in these introductions uh, in Wyoming, unfortunately. Uh, I do I do trash and garbage stuff, um, mostly, so I don't know that much. Uh, we yeah. all do trash and garbage. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That is the legal industry sort of <laughs> encapsulated. Excellent. And, uh, and Michael? Uh, so my name is Michael on Twitter. I'm uh, at Fleeroff. I am not a lawyer in good standing in New York at the current <laughs> time. Uh, previously did white collar. Um, I hope to get up to date on my continuing legal education shortly. Um. <laughs> uh, so Michael, Michael's off the stops, podcast. Michael's <laughs> We're kicking him out of the yeah, that's done. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Michael, uh, once he learns how to segregate client funds, will be allowed to talk with us again. Um, but it's we're going to talk about uh, the issues of the day, just uh, interesting legal news. Uh, the first thing I think that everyone wants to talk about was the just concluded J-20 trial, uh, where the federal government attempted to prosecute uh, a group of people for being in the neighborhood of property damage during a protest. Um, and uh, I think to everyone's relief, not only did the judge throw out the most serious charges, uh, the felony charges, but the jury uh, ultimately did not believe that uh, the government had proved any uh, any case against any of the defendants because they didn't prove that any of them did any damage. Right. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like a fascist stooge here, 
But but I, I kind of get the argument that with uh, Antifa or is it Antifa or um, it's pronounced Tarek. Tarek. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, or Tariq, either one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that uh, you know, when everybody dresses up in black and wears masks, that they're even the peaceful protesters are acting as sort of cover for the non-peaceful ones. It's not something I would buy, but there's a certain logic to it. Um, yeah, the prosecutor that, called it uh, a, a moving getaway car. All 100 of them right. were a getaway car for everyone who was doing the actual damage, which is right. an interesting argument. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting in a like, sort of law school classroom sense. It's not in a, I want to <laughs> deprive someone of their liberty sense, you know? But, I mean, I mean, it's funny... Like the the only time I sort of ever give it credibility in my head is it's sort of what the clan robes did too, right? It right. just sort of gave everyone the anonymity to carry on, except I don't think there ever was really the kind of pretense with the clan that they were there to protest something. You know, like there wasn't someone who was incidentally attending a, a a cross burning, right, right, right. Like that was that was on the invitation. It's like we're going to go burn a cross, but there also didn't seem to be a dispute that there was a genuine protest going on, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like if you take something like the rally in Skokie, there was a march down the street, and I don't think there was ever any attempt to kind of separate out people from the march from other people everyone was just sort of presumed to be in the march you know and i guess if any damage happened any individual would be responsible for it right and um you know i think it was the washington examiner sort of got an interview with one of the jurors who said something along the lines of you know none of us believed uh there's any criminal liability for simply showing up to a protest uh, and so I think it was clear that they were thinking about it along those lines, that there was a peaceful protest and, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with attending that regardless of what you're wearing. Um, yeah, they were trying to get a D.C. jury pool to convict on uh, people who had been to a Trump protest. I don't know how effective that was really going to be, but, you know. Well, it's sort of it's sort of uh, uh, heartwarming uh, to see that result in a day when we're you know potentially passing laws that it's OK to run over. Uh, people for attending a protest. So right. right. Strike, score one for the system this this day. Yeah, I, though I thought it was interesting after it was over and they got this adverse jury verdict, the government's like, yeah, we're still going forward with the rest <laughs> of the prosecutions. And, and I'm not sure what the legal status of this is. Like, I can't tell. I mean, every individual has somewhat individualized facts but there there didn't seem to be sort of a set standard of proof from the judge since the judge allowed a lot of these i presume that any of the cases any of the charges that the judge dismissed on insufficient proof will have to have new facts presented in order to get to a jury a second time Right. But for the for the charges that got to the jury, you know, I don't think that they're barred just because the jury rendered an adverse verdict. Right. Like it's in the failure of proof is not the same as the, the on a fact basis as the legal failure of proof on the charges that the judge threw out. Right. And that's, uh, you know, the interview with the with that juror was interesting because he he was saying one of the one of the defendants was a journalist who had a video camera. And so they actually had this video record of the the journalist who was, I guess, somewhat um, animated and excited about the protest. And so, you know, the prosecutors were arguing that he was sort of egging on the uh, the violence um, to the extent there was any property damage and and whatnot. and so the juror said that they considered him separately, that they talked about his facts in particular um, and whether or not he should be, you know, given different consideration. And so you can kind of see how individuals could play out differently. Um, you know, in theory, the government might have a stronger factual case against uh, another set of defendants. 
Right. I thought the I thought the medic was interesting too, in that they found the fact that the medic came prepared to do medicine right. was a damning was a damning fact. As if as if like the the fact that they brought medics meant they knew there would be violence. Yeah, from the fucking cops. Yeah, I mean, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. wasn't it? Wasn't it the case that these people were were like corralled or what do they call it? Kettling? Kettled. Kettled. Yeah. yeah. They, were, they were they were pushed into a sort of mass and soaked with uh, pepper spray, etc. I mean, uh, I don't know yeah. why you would need a medic for that. That seems, yeah. that seems that's an everyday occurrence for me. I'm well, constantly I mean, being it's detained. more. I mean, it's more the fact that there's a difference between. Uh, preparing for inevitable violence that you are hoping for and planning for and preparing for the inevitable violence that seems to come with every protest right if right. if ever history recent history has shown that every time people get together to protest the government the police have a very sort of short fuse for how long they'll let it go on right and the ref- like declining to immediately follow a dispersal order means that things get rough very quickly so it's like very boy scout right be prepared <laughs> have someone there with band-aids right. band-aids and apple right. cider vinegar <laughs> yeah. right right yeah. Another uh, another thing about this that was sort of heartening, at least, was I, I believe many of the defendants sort of signed on to some kind of joint statement of principle that they were not going to rat on each other or something. Did anybody read about that? I didn't, but that sounds right. Yeah, that seems yeah. right to me. I mean, no one, as far as I can tell, no one's pled out. No one's tried to settle. Everyone's yeah. fighting it. I think that there were like points of unity or something that sort of re- reinforcing that it was uh, political charges and that they were we were all going to refuse to cooperate or, or interplead, mm-hmm. uh, which yeah. which sort of takes away a big tool uh, tool in the tool belt for for the prosecution and these things. I think, yeah. right. No, it seems like the sort of thing that the prosecution would use as evidence of conspiracy. <laughs> right. exactly. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if that if could. I were a lawyer, I would let my client <laughs> sign a document saying I will not. Uh, I will not uh, participate in any pursuit of this group that I am definitely a member of. <laughs> <laughs> it does give credence to the moving getaway car theory of the case. Yeah. Right. Look, we didn't we didn't all band into this conspiracy to only turn on each other as soon as people <laughs> noticed. It's I mean, that is an interesting legal argument um to to cuz like basically black block as a tactic is not uncommon now. Uh since the uh since the 90s it's been pretty common pretty at a lot of leftist anarchist uh protests. And I guess if I were a very unscrupulous pr- uh, prosecutor, I could come out and say, like, if you're in a black block, you are uh, blacked up, you know what you're doing, that's, I mean, that's evidence of a conspiracy. You know what happens at black block rallies, and you're here in black. Like, if you right. if you, if you you laid out the history of everything from the Seattle World Trade Organization protests all the way up to the present day, and then said, and now look at these, these poor uh, Starbucks, their window got broken... All of these people need to go to prison for at least six months um, as compensation for that window. I, 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 that that seems to me uh, in our that that would be an argument with some legs, unfortunately, because black block rules. Uh, it's great. Right. It's a good thing. Everyone should do it. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, there's a guy at the door with a uh, yeah. <laughs> with a trial subpoena. James just got disbarred. Uh, oh, yeah. Damn. <laughs> They're trying to figure out how to get jurisdiction over him in the District of Columbia, even though he's in Wyoming, as a as the plotter of a previous protest. Well, there was someone uh, at this uh, someone who's in the one of the 150 people got charged wasn't even at the protest, right? That was my understanding that there was just a person who talked about the protest. Or am I making that up? I mean, I buy it. Yeah. (laughs) For our purposes, that's true and horrible. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And such such an excessive massive overreach by the DC prosecutor. (laughs) We can all agree that is a that is a gross injustice. If it is in fact the case. (laughs) 
No, but you know, we are we're joking about. Um, I think James said uh, hypothetically, if he was an unscrupulous prosecutor, he could see uh, putting forward this argument, and it's like. Well, this prosecutor was plainly unscrupulous. Like every <laughs> every story out of this was like, you know, the prosecutor doing something so basically wrong that a uh, first year law student would uh, would blush. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think one of the funny things about the jury verdict is the jury verdict saved uh, the prosecution, the prosecution from getting really humiliated on appeal Oh yeah, for, Absolutely. for some really grotesque <laughs> arguments. I mean, one where, <laughs> where the prosecutor said, look, reasonable doubt is a lot of words. <laughs> you're going to get this jury instruction and it doesn't you're gonna, mean anything. The, the judge is just going to be like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I want you to be clear that reasonable doubt is something. And then the judge is like, wait, pardon me? Wait, did, did, you just, did you just tell the jury not to listen to my instruction? I said, no, no, no. I just meant that it's complicated and it boils down to. And the judge is like, all right, jury, I want to be clear. <laughs> When I give you the definition of reasonable doubt, you are to listen to every word that I say, and that's what it means. <laughs> it's unbelievable. There, there will be a time when I define it for you, and I don't know what she's doing right now, but what she is doing is not making it easier for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the other what was one, the other one? Yeah, the other so one. The, so this is uh, on closing argument. Which, if you're not a lawyer listening to this podcast, I'm so sorry. But if you <laughs> uh, if you're not the closing argument, you're supposed to go over everything that you know, you're supposed to tell the story using all the evidence and testimony that came before you. You're not supposed to be testifying. You're just telling the story, weaving together all the facts that are already in the record. It's like a highlight reel. It's like a highlight reel. It's like a highlight reel. reel where you're like, this is why we told you right. what we told you. Remember right? in we're the opening. Put it together. In the opening, we said we were going to tell you all these things. Then we told you all these things. And now it's the closing, and we're telling you all these things again. Uh, and in closing, uh, the second chair prosecutor decided to say, now look, uh, one of our witnesses, uh, Detective Cop McPig, uh, he wasn't allowed to tell you about the backpack that one of the defendants was wearing. Uh, and here's what he was going to say if he had been allowed to testify <laughs> about that. He was going to say, look at that purple backpack. Look at that purple backpack. You can see it follow her throughout. And the judge stopped him and was like, Mr. Koresh, you're not trying to undermine my ruling keeping that evidence out, are you? <laughs> no, no, Your Honor. Of course not. I, was, I definitely would not be trying to undercut your evidence here. No, no, I would never be doing that. Uh, and then all six defendants' lawyers were up there with Mr. Koresh uh, trying to figure out, how are we going to fix the fact that you just said evidence that was not allowed, that was explicitly kept out by the judge? I and- mean, there's there's honestly a reasonable chance that if there had been an adverse ruling, the judge may have just dismissed on those grounds anyway. At least right. as I think against the judge- that defendant. They, right, there would have been an, there would have been an appeals argument by everyone. They certainly would have made a motion after the verdict for a new trial on those grounds or a mistrial on those grounds. But again, the prosecutor just got saved by having such a bad case that their in trial unethical acts never ended up having to be tested right. by an appeals court. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's. Uh... You know, and it's kind of... I mean, it's... Well, I, I was going to say, it's there's like this ju- disjunction, too, where I think a lot of us were very worried about, A, this, the general sort of um, feeling that it's uh, there's something very wrong with the government trying to jail 200 pro- protesters. Um, mm-hmm. And then, B, that they're using these sorts of very unethical uh, prosecutorial methods to do so. Um, but then you get out and, you know, the jurors are saying that they, the protesters should be applauded, not jailed. And it's like, wait, <laughs> maybe we didn't need to worry that much at all. Like this, was, this doesn't seem like it was ever, uh, in doubt as to where this was going in, in fact. Which, right. Well, I mean, just the, 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 the lesson to take from this is uh, only protest in places like DC or the Bronx. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 I mean, that's what I was, I was about to say that the government's next move 
is that they're going to make a motion for a change of venue. <laughs> right. You know, to like and they're gonna Western ask Virginia. To go to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're like, we just look, what we want to do is we want to go to Maricopa County <laughs> because we think the ripple effects of this protest have. Uh, Tainted the jury spread pool. Spread out yeah, enough. irreparably. It's just right. not fair for these people to be tried by a jury of their peers. They need to be tried by a jury of someone else's peers because this is not working. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to say that, I mean, obviously you got to talk about the collateral consequences of being charged. Even though they got off, a lot of people's lives were ruined by having to come to D.C. every couple of months for this. So Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, and I don't know how much of it was pro bono because this could have, I, I think at least some of it was, but it would have been incredibly expensive. This mm-hmm. is a really long process. Says. Yep. All six defendants had their own attorney, um, which I guess is nice. But uh, hopefully that was all pro bono, or else. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's <laughs> you know that's on your record. You have to say yeah. you've been you know indicted and charged and, and all that. That's what's this six month gap in your employment? Oh, I was right. on trial in a different state. <laughs> right. For for what? Uh, <laughs> What were you on trial for? Oh, I was on trial for providing medical attention <laughs> to, to someone who uh, apparently didn't deserve it. Had I a camera in the, the wrong place. Position. Guys, they're getting their Soros checks, so they're, you know, they're... <laughs> right, you're right. They're very comfortable. That's... Right. I mean, they're, it's true. They're all millionaires, which makes it fun. Um, I guess the next, if we wanted to go from the serious to the completely ridiculous, the next topic on our agenda is uh, Dr. Carter Page, comma, definitely not Esquire, um, <laughs> attempting to file a brief, uh, an amicus curie brief in the uh, government's opposition to the AT&T Time Warner merger. Um, and I don't know how many of you actually got to read the brief. <clears throat> oh, oh, I read But it, it was sort of... It was sort of a master class in uh, not understanding anything. Um, okay, he, so step one, because I don't know anything, is who is Carter Page? Uh, Carter Page is Carter Page is one of the Trump campaign's foreign policy advisors. Right. Though I'm unclear what his foreign policy credentials are, I, he's basically a hedge fund guy. I can I can tell you his foreign policy credentials, which is sure his PhD is in uh, something to do with Russia <laughs> um, and the the post Soviet states, which he got from um, a University of London um, after failing. His his thesis defense twice, <laughs> and accusing yes. his uh, the, the professors who failed him of bias and getting a new professor, and on the third try, getting his PhD. Um, yes, so that's his foreign policy <laughs> <laughs> experience, and, and the professors talk about it's pretty amazing. They're like, you know, you see the emails he sent them where he. Uh, said he was being persecuted he compared himself to like political exiles in prison um what is what is with this campaign i'm pretty sure insane. that uh sebastian gorka got his phd by like writing a book of poetry or something <laughs> right. like, like, right. yeah. like it's another like it's it's like this whole thing of box top credentials yeah but these <laughs> these these are the smart guys right uh, of, yeah. the, of this of this crew these right. are the intellectuals right. these are the, the credentials yeah yes. exactly the rest yeah. of them are uncredentialed uh in comparison well, I was going to say he worked for Merrill Litch in Russia as well for three years, and his supervisor described him as completely unremarkable in every respect. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody, nobody remembers him, if I recall correctly. <laughs> and that's the best performance review he's ever gotten. So he wants to file, he intervenes, and this is great, he intervenes on behalf of the government. Right. Right. He wants to file an amicus curiae in support of the government to oppose the merger. And he wants to oppose the merger because all of the consolidation in the media industry is part of a government conspiracy to narrow the messages coming out of the mainstream media and specifically 
to make fun of Carter. <laughs> right. Right. Like that is really the basis of his complaint is that the mainstream media kept lying about his ties to Russia and therefore the merger shouldn't go through. <laughs> and he includes a chart of all of these like different media mergers and how they affected the market, which seemed true enough. But I think the ink was still dry. It was still drying on the brief when Fox and Disney announced their merger spec and that didn't make it into the brief. <laughs> like, right. like, like fa- the fact that Fox was joining a major conglomerate was not relevant in any capacity. Um, <clears throat> this is like a motion to move the Overton window. Uh, right. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, but I don't know. The, the easier thing to read if you haven't read the uh, if you haven't read the Carter Page motion to file an amicus curiae is the government's motion in opposition. Which uh, of course they would file because they're part of the conspiracy to encourage the conglomeration. Right. This is the deep the, state fighting back against Carter Page. But That's exactly the, right. the government's motion in opposition could literally fit on a postcard. Ooh. Because they filed something which said, usually the government takes the position that they will not oppose amicus curiae because why not just let everyone have their say? But in this case, we don't think he has anything to say. Sign the government. <laughs> That's the whole thing. <laughs> right? We don't think this will be helpful. And then the judge is like, yeah, it's not helpful. <laughs> Man. And denied the motion to submit an amicus curiae brief. These poor guys, these all these hangers on of the Trump administration were like on TV defending him, hoping to get a job in the administration, and they just got just got cucked, just wiped out <laughs> a month in the administration. They're just like, no, we don't need you. Carter Page, you're out. Uh, Corey Lewandowski, a month before the election, we're not talking to you anymore. Manafort, uh, just gone. Manafort, gone. Yeah, I... I mean, I'm not I'm not sure it's as cucked as all like people pretend it is just because they're all loyalists, like they're all still doing the same thing. I just think they're like, look, you're not useful to us ruining the Department of Energy. We've got Rick Perry to do that. We uh, why don't you just go and rant on cable television, which is the only way that Trump will speak to you anyway. <laughs> I just I love this I love this just this 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 is really for me a whole summation of Carter Page is his second sentence on his Wikipedia page <laughs> the founder and managing partner of Global Energy Capital a one man investment fund and <laughs> consulting firm specializing in the Russian and Central Asian oil and gas business he will invest your money and he'll consult for your business it's a one man operation well now he, he can, can add a uh, one man law firm to one man law firm <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> a litigation boutique <laughs> Wait, what, yeah. which which one of you? Which somebody pointed out uh, the, the, that he signed the cover of of this yeah. thing, but yeah, that was me. <laughs> electronically yeah. signed the signature block. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right? The signature the signature <laughs> block has a slash sign on it where it just says slash s and his name typed out, uh, which is something that people do when they're filing electronically all the time. It's like not unusual for the non lawyers here. Again, very sorry. Uh, but he <laughs> But on the front page it's actually physically signed. And to me that's just a mystery because it means that he scanned it before filing. <laughs> and right. if you were going to print it out and scan it, sign on the fucking signature block, you lunatic. Like, that's where your name is. He's covering his bases. He's like, I don't know if I have to do ink or electronic. I'm just going to do both in different parts, and that's got to work. Disruptive. It's, like, it's disruptive. It's like writing a letter on the outside of the envelope <laughs> and then not putting a piece of paper inside it before you <laughs> mail. <laughs> yeah, he also, I mean, this is the other funny thing I thought in the in the introduction to his brief before he just started complaining about media mergers is that he says that, you know, he's a frequent guest on cable television uh, shows <laughs> where he tries to make similar arguments to the ones he's making in the amicus brief, 
but, quote, they are generally not receptive. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> And this is so it's like a it's like a motion to stop being owned. Right. <laughs> this is this is a theme in his in his life, right? It goes back to the the PhD where he he thought it was anti-Russian and anti-American bias that was preventing him from getting his PhD to these letters he was sending to the DOJ earlier this year saying uh you know the Clinton regime may be among the most extreme examples of human rights violations observed during any US election in US history since Dr Martin Luther King Jr he was similarly <laughs> targeted for his anti-war views in the 60s that's how that's how this guy sees himself as the the he's, he's conservatism distilled right the yeah. target of a mass mass prosecution across a telecommunications government oligopoly. That's that's what he thinks. Yeah. Your Honor, I think the conclusion of this trial should be uh, the mandatory carry of the Carter Page Network, <laughs> which is uh, part of my one-man uh, hedge fund and consultancy <laughs> and law firm and independent news network. Right. But he's Mike Cernovich. He's Mike Cernovich. <laughs> I just love this name, Global Energy Capital. Oh, that's such a good name. So, somebody at the Daily Beast, I think, or maybe it was Salon, scored an interview with him and went to the office. And it was like, uh, you know, a co workspace that he rents by the hour. It's like a windowless <laughs> office. <laughs> it's, it's just like a desk and like a whiteboard on wheels. And like, that's it. That's, that's... Global Energy Solutions, <laughs> care of mailboxes, etc. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, you can meet me next door. I have a a table I call my usual at the Chinese restaurant <laughs> next door to the mailboxes, etc. Oh, I was going to say, this guy was meeting with, you know, the pr- Prime Minister of Hungary's top advisors on behalf of the, the Trump campaign. <laughs> you know, like, this was, <laughs> he was like a major foreign policy piece. Like, now he is trying to downplay it, but yeah. <laughs> The grift worked. Like, his Wikipedia page is, like, uh, life and career, sort of a failure. He did graduate from the Naval Academy, served the Navy for five years, got a Master of Arts in National Security Studies. You know, like, it's, uh, he founded his own investment fund with a mid-level Gazprom executive. That guy, I'm sure, was fucking stellar. Uh, (laughs) The the fund operates out of a Manhattan co-working space shared with a wedding band booking agency. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like every every meeting he had with, like, these Hungarian uh, ministers ended with Carter Page realizing he left his wallet at home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, uh, can someone else get this? I promise. Next time, it's on me. But this time... I uh, <laughs> oh, it's back at the hotel room, and I'm really sorry. He'd take him to Starbucks, and they'd all uh, put Trump Trump Maga as their name on the cups uh, before the meeting. <laughs> he just oh my Poor. god, he just but like all of this, he did all this bullshit. He he worked in the co working space next to a wedding band booking agency. I'm going to say that five more times in this podcast <laughs> for years, and then all of a sudden he was the first person with a PhD and anything vaguely Russian to endorse uh, Donald Trump, and Donald Trump's like. All right, you're going to Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're my guy. It, it worked. It yeah. completely worked. Like, all right, I saw you on cable TV one time because, uh, like, the first two people backed out and you were their third option. Uh, <laughs> great. You're my guy. You're in the campaign now. I'm name dropping uh, you specifically. <laughs> Carter Page, PhD, as one of my top advisors. Carter. <laughs> <laughs> that really does seem like how Trump staffed everything. Yes. <laughs> it's the first person, the first person to like Trump out loud. Jeff right. Sessions like, is yeah, now the attorney general for that reason. First right. to endorse him, now he's the attorney general. It's unbelievable. I, I Well, it's I working. Really, he's fixing all the problems. I look back yes. on it and I think that uh, I could be famous and loathed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like there was there was a time I could have invested in Bitcoin. I could have I could have been the I could have been like the head of the civil rights division at the Justice Department. <laughs> Dismantling like are, it, but still. There are regrets. <laughs> there are regrets. You wouldn't have opposed his amicus. 
uh, if you if you had it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you would have supported it uh, full throatedly. Yeah, I would have. I definitely would have. Uh, I would have uh, allowed him to intervene as uh, an additional plaintiff, <laughs> and they'd have been like, "Are you sure there's a private right of action here?" And I would have said, "Now there is, Your Honor." <laughs> Man, I could have been the Region 8 EPA attorney. Oh, what a gig that would be. <laughs> oh, aim high. Aim, yeah. Listen, I just graduated from law school. I'm not, like, Carter Page has been a PhD for 15 years, Look, and he got drummed out in two you months. Could have been, you could have been a judge. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> wait two years, and you are judicial material. <laughs> well, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do, do you know what younger abstention is? No, I don't. <laughs> okay, then you're in. Perfect. <laughs> I, that, by the way, I thought was a little... Like, when they asked... When they asked the questions, like the the younger abstention and the Pullman abstention, I admit that I had a like a general idea of what they were, but I don't really. It's been a long time since I took the bar. Like I don't remember all of those things, and they honestly right. don't come up a ton, right? But when when Peterson didn't know what a motion in limine was, or, or, or fucking Dauber, like come on, man, or yeah, he didn't know Dauber, and he didn't when he was asked. If he was familiar with the federal rules of evidence and he's like, well, I haven't read it in some time (laughs) as if it's like infinite jest or something like you just sort of curl up on the beach with the FRE and go cover to cover. Oh, I can't believe it ended this way. (laughs) I really I really thought it would end on hearsay, but that's just in the middle. I can't wait to get to the sequel, The Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure. No. <laughs> the best part about it is, like, I'm sure they would have taken the, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at the recent case law on younger abstention, but his answer was, actually, Senator Kennedy, the fact that I don't know anything means that I'm perfect for this job. <laughs> there are many people from many walks of life who have been successful in things they've never, ever done before. For example, the President of the United States <laughs> used to be a real estate executive and television personality, and look at him now. He's fixing all the problems. <laughs> He defeated ISIS, and now he's fixing all the problems. Uh, yeah, people gonna... people responded by saying, like, he should have studied better. And I don't think you can, like, actually no. sort of cram to know how litigation works. But you can take, like, a day to figure out how testifying <laughs> works. Well, I mean, you've got a law degree, for God's sake. Just bullshit your way through it. You know, I mean, abstention, yeah. of course. That's the, where you abstain. And, you know, I mean, he, he didn't even try. He just Whoever, folded up I, like a bag. I believe younger abstention is generally known as age before beauty, <laughs> Your Honor. It's not too bad, see? Yeah, that's... that's... Um, but, the, I mean, I, re- I really do think, like, with those things, he could have gotten away with it. But the, the thing is, he didn't know Anything. the difference between... <laughs> Pullman abstention and motion in limine. And so he didn't know which were the softballs he should have known and which were the more tricky ones. He could have like been like, well, Your Honor, my area of practice is exclusively federal. And so there isn't much intersection with state law. Right. And so I don't know how much uh, intersection. I don't know much about the federal state, you know, abstention doctrines right, that's an act that's an acceptable answer from a guy whose whole career has been in election law but if he s- instead is like unfrozen caveman lawyer <laughs> you know i don't know with the defendant in the prosecutor and, <laughs> and the plaintiff these are all very new terms to me but i know that with the assistance of clerks i'll know who's sitting where he also he kept saying that he had a supervisory experience for attorneys, and uh, you know, as someone in admin law, sort of. But what he's saying is that he's the client of lawyers. He's saying that he has lawyers who advise him on the law when he makes decisions, right. and so that's why he knows about the law because he has lawyers that work for him. That's not really that does not. My client yeah. probably could not be a federal judge. He's a smart guy, and I like him, but like. He doesn't know what I know. 
Right. Yeah. No, I mean, right. I think he came to be an... I, I will say he probably is a reasonable expert in election law. Like, he was he was an associate at, a, you know, doing election law for a bunch of years, and then he was the lawyer for a client... His client for a long time, mm-hmm. he was the lawyer doing election law for various uh, Republican congressional committees, you know. So he was on the right side of a very narrow issue. But, like, the district court job, you're, like, handling... You're handling, like, diversity slip and fall cases, you know? And he just doesn't know anything that isn't specifically election law and would have been an abysmal judge for anyone who had to practice in front of him. It was a D.C. district, right? I mean, he would have been trying the J-20 defendants. Right. (laughs) No, that's exactly right. He would have slept through all those sidebars. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You're right. Uh, This... uh, this this reasonable doubt stuff, I don't get it. And, and uh, like, how do we expect an them? appellate judge can rely pretty heavily on clerks if need be, but a, a, but a district judge, they need to make rulings in the moment, you know? You can't right. do everything by written opinion. <laughs> like, if somebody objects, <laughs> you can't be like, well, let's, uh, you know, take counsel, a 15 Counsel, 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 counsel. This is all very interesting. <laughs> Counsel, this is all very interesting, but can you tell me if their voter registration was up to date? <laughs> That's because pretty... I want to get this back into my wheel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we uh, have another topic up, I believe. Uh, was this? Uh, yeah, the, I guess the third the third topic we want to cover today uh, is uh, everyone saw the uh, amazing uh, Wayne Coke video of him making it work with obscene and grotesque T-shirts for novelty bowling teams. Uh, oh, that's but, the, oh my god! You're right. That's the perfect application for those. Shirts. And so he he first burst into new the news. Everyone found this kind of crazy uh, shirt company video because he is suing his ex fiance for the return of his engagement ring. The well, actually, I shouldn't call it his engagement ring, as that is the matter under dispute. Right, an engagement uh, ring, <laughs> an engagement ring given by him to her uh, on conditions to be established in a court of law. Uh, but the engagement ended, and she is keeping the ring, um, which is like some grotesque number of carrots. And uh, is the kind of thing that a billionaire who looks like a grown up Pugsley uh, <laughs> would give to someone who looks like a normal human woman. Well, I saw something on Twitter that said, uh, you know, he looked like the uh, the redheaded kid from the far side, the old Gary Larson cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so perfect. It's that absolutely true. Did you see the... Uh... He's pushing on the pole sign. The, the Vic Burger <laughs> right, video exactly. comparing him to uh, uh, the uh, evil guy in, in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Francis. Francis was his name. Francis. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, but, so how do we generally feel about engagement rings? Gift? Conditional gift? Well, so, because I always think it's crazy that you could ask for the engagement ring back. Yeah. Like it just, it seems to me like... You know, here is this thing, and I have a question. Uh, And then, you know, if you say yes, you get to keep the ring, but that kind of ends the transactional part of it. From from my perspective, it should depend on how repulsive the giver is. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So in this case, having to have put up with some, uh, you know, measure of his company uh, for some measure of time, I think the, the ring is minimally... Uh, the compensation she deserves. <laughs> if that were the test that the court were going to use, I think that we would spend a lot of time talking about those shirts. I mean, like shirts. obviously, if you look at himself, and he is a he's a pretty doughy person. But like, if you look at the shirts and just look, imagine spending hours and hours every day with this guy talking about those shirts. Yeah, she gets the ring. Well, I mean, that's the. I'll say this: three, I'm... three additional rings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> We're awarding the ex-fiance attorney's fees and 
<laughs> more more diamonds. I feel like in Nevada, outside of uh, the municipality of Las Vegas, a judge would just find on his own motion that it was clearly a payment for sex. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Like wherever that's legal, the judge would just be like, put away, put away all of your motion papers. I'm just ruling on this one from the bench. He just sees him coming to the courtroom. (laughs) Nope, you're out. You lose. I'm sorry. I know it's done. done. We're done here. (laughs) Right. (laughs) No, no, no. Get out. He loses. But but someone, uh, James, you 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 Lexus this. You've you've done actual research. I've done research. Help us out here. Yes, I'll, I'll help you guys out. So obviously we all feel that the correct and just outcome is that she gets to keep the ring, obviously. Uh, I mean, in my personal experience, when I break up with people after moving in with them, which I've done more than once, uh, I've left some things behind. Because, like, you can just sell that. That's compensation. Obviously this didn't work out, and you just keep it. You can just keep that. <laughs> it's very, very noble of James to uh, leave the Vitamix. Yeah. I, I left. I, I left an Xbox. I left an Xbox behind, and the girl. She didn't even game. She was just. I know she just put that on Craigslist for twenty bucks. But I was like, that's you know what? That's fine. I don't need it. It's yours. You've earned it. Um, <laughs> you've earned it. You put up. Yeah. Uh, so you saw this face every day. Um, so, so there's three different tests. There's a, a majority test, a minority test, and a Montana test. And in the majority of states the engagement ring is a conditional gift. And if the marriage is over, uh, if the if the engagement is called off, the uh, the giver of the ring, I don't want to say the guy because, you know, obviously it's not only men and women getting married these days, uh, but the giver of the ring gets the ring back. No question. There's no analysis. The court doesn't look into it. Uh, so it's actually the opposite outcome of what everyone in this podcast agrees is just. And then in a significant minority of states... Uh, what the court does instead is it's it's presumed that it goes back to the giver, but the court will engage in an analysis to see if it is the giver's fault that the engagement broke up. Uh, so there's a fault-based analysis. And obviously, uh, I feel like if we're applying this test... They just show the shirts video. They just show the shirts video. <laughs> Like which it's it seems like a weird thing um, that like it's very it's a very family law dispute for the two parties to have to like put in evidence about whose fault it is that the engagement ended, and then the court has to make right. a decision. The court has to make a finding of fact. Uh, right, but a bunch of I would like to call a bunch of fake friends to the stand. <laughs> Mo- motion but and then- eliminate to excuse uh, to exclude my face uh, from being shown <laughs> to the jury. <laughs> Look, it's look, highly prejudicial. All evidence, all evidence of my personality is highly prejudicial, Your Honor. <laughs> Outweighs the probative effect. I cannot. I cannot. It's just. It's un, un, unacceptable. And I guess uh, it it might have helped uh, for for again for the unfortunate non lawyers who might listen to our show uh, to go over that a, a gift. In almost all circumstances, a gift is very clean cut. It's you are giving someone something with the intent to make a gift and then that's it and you can't you usually cannot get it back because uh, right. it's a gift like that's the point of the gift it's not really a great gift if there's conditions on it uh, an engagement ring is one of the big exceptions uh, and Montana as far as I can tell on using my legal research skills uh, is the only state that has said yeah it's an unconditional gift uh, the engagement ring is a gift the person who gets the get the ring gets to keep it I don't care whose fault it is uh, that's that's where we're going in, in flying in the face of every other state court that has decided this issue, Montana has gone the other way. So props to Montana for that one thing and that one thing only. The individualists of Montana consider an engagement ring a well-earned uh, sweat of your own brow <laughs> income. Maybe they're just very romantic out there. You know, they're uh, they're very woke. <laughs> they're very woke. Yeah. If Kev were here, yeah. he would say Montana decided this because they're woke. Yeah, right, give your it, give your diamonds to women. Clap, give clap, your clap. diamonds. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's I. If ever, hang on, hang on. I'm going through the Albinger v. Harris. Uh, for those of you keeping score at home, it's 2002 MT 118. Montana has a public domain citation method, and you can see in paragraph 60 they they cite Lauren Chiefelk. They say like. <laughs> <laughs> They say they, they they go to her Twitter account. Unfortunately, the link is dead because she got banned. Um, yeah. But they they cite they have screenshots of her Twitter account and uh, you know give your engagement rings to women. Like that's that's yeah. 
I think it's very impressive that they uh, actually gave credit to Lauren Chief Elk instead of uh, the man who stole her idea. <laughs> right. Right. Tarek, you mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or however you say it. <laughs> it's just Wyatt Coke is so great to me. Like he he really is the face of like here's who the tax bill benefits. This guy is going to get like 3 billion more dollars because of this bill. This guy right. specifically. And just just look at his face. I mean, he's so look at his face. <laughs> he's not even the son of one of the big cokes. He's a son of the third coke who doesn't even give to to the Republican Party, but he's still going to get billions of dollars. The, the the third coke is the one that built his own private ghost town in Colorado for him and his nerd friends to hang out in. Um, because that's the thing that rich people do. I respect that. Oh wait, is that? I thought he was the son of the. I thought he was the son of the wine guy. No, no, he's the son of the recluse. He's the son of the recluse. Yeah. Uh, Vanity Fair refers to him as still a card-carrying billionaire, and that's nice. It's nice that even yeah. though they don't hang out, they're still all billionaires. I think it's, I think it's nice that they made cards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's just a solid platinum uh, piece of, uh, like, it's just the size of a wallet size photo. And it just says, yes, I am a billionaire. And it's to show ladies at the bar. Yeah. I need one of those. <laughs> uh, I just, I, I love this guy. The videos of him, like, looking at all of it, it's, it's so good. It's so good. This country whips. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, man. Uh, the, the the limited research that I've done suggests that Florida is a straight-up conditional gift state, so uh, given that they did not actually get married, it does not look good for her. She probably is going to have to return the ring. Um, yeah, That's which is a real tragic oh. outcome to this story. I know, I hate to end on a downer. Um, Jesus but Christ. Like, yeah, I know. And I bet this is a boon for his business. <laughs> there there really are a lot of people the, who I know who did not he, know he about. must have this whole controversy he must have sold six seven shirts yes the sales are up three thousand <laughs> percent yes sales have never been better there's people in, in like uh, the middle of the holler in Missouri that are like I'm buying the white coke shirts because the libs hate it <laughs> right. It's, it's, right. <laughs> I'm walking right. down the street and they're like they're screaming at me they're like why are there fuzzy handcuffs on your shirt it's amazing <laughs> no, that's great. It comes in sizes from uh, XL to 6XL. <laughs> <laughs> he really, I just, I can't, like, this guy is a billionaire. He's going to be an even billion, billion, billionaire after his nerd dad dies. And he's fighting about a quarter million dollar ring. Like, that's like if I saw a dollar on the ground and, like, sued a homeless guy for picking it up. Like, I can't, like, just let her keep the ring, man. Just, oh, how, do you th- how do you think he got to be a billionaire? All right? <laughs> that's true. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. Being smart about money in this way. That's exactly right. why he's him and you're you. That's, right. you're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You know, he... You know he bought that ring with a coupon too. They're like really savvy. <laughs> it's it's Groupon, but it's specifically for frivolous wealthy purposes. That's right. Perfect. He has six engagement rings. He bought six engagement rings. <laughs> He's going to correctly use all anticipating the that that not not his first nor second attempt. We're going to get him all the way to marriage. He's going to need some backups. I think though. I think one of the really kind of funny things is when you see the photo. Of the two of them together. Oh, yeah. Like, I end up being vaguely sympathetic because I do have a really hard time finding a reason that she was ever with him that doesn't boil down to so she can walk away with an expensive engagement. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Right. I mean, he's... It's like he's not good looking no right you're like okay well maybe if he was good looking but not interesting uh and then you see the video and you're like he's also not interesting (laughs) right there was there was no interesting conversation going on there i mean look i'm i'm an unattractive but kind of interesting guy and so i can i can see how someone could be like oh yeah unattractive is tolerable 
right? I mean, <laughs> I have 11 years of someone finding unattractive tolerable. Congratulations. But he's neither of those things. But he is a billionaire. Right. <laughs> but he's got a shitload of money. And so, and so, look, I'm not Columbo, but I figured out what she saw in him. Right. Which is fine. That's fine. I don't care. Get your money. Who cares? No, I'm and, very right, much, right. I, I, as much as I was mocking Lauren Chiefelk five minutes ago, I'm very much on her side with this. Get your money. I don't care. Who cares? Yes. It right. feels very transactional. And, and so it feels like she should get her end of the transaction at the end of it, right? Like she gave him. Uh, you know, uh, something pretty to have on his arm and uh, companionship. Yeah, but this and, is, and she, but this is the result of the scales finally falling from Wyatt Coke's eyes, <laughs> <laughs> where he's like, "Oh my God, she didn't love me for me," <laughs> yeah. and so and so he's lashing out. Right. He's lashing out because <laughs> all of those times she said, "I love you." While looking at a bank statement, uh, he thought she meant him. <laughs> they, oh God! So page six apparently got the court documents, uh, but they did not link to the court documents or put them online. I was going to read from them if they existed, but they do not. That's uh, very that's, unfortunate. That's disappointing. Yeah, I know. Apparently, the the quotes they have is that he demanded the return of the ring on multiple occasions and says that she received the ring as a conditional gift and refuses to return it despite proper demand and the condition not being fulfilled, which the condition not being fulfilled is a very passive way of saying she stopped fucking me. Like, back. <laughs> right. yeah. like it's honestly like the condition not being fulfilled is like I, it's that's that's an ominous phrase to me. Yeah, she passed out in a pool of sweat when I started uh, asking her to decide uh, to arrange the, the guests at tables. As soon as we set a date, she was like, oh, it's real for me now. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Too real. She ran screaming from the flower shop. I, I'm curious, though, if, if she had said, like, oh, hey, let's get eloped, and, and they went and just ran off to, like, Mexico or Vegas or something, got married, and then, like, a month later she divorced him she gets to keep the ring right because the condition was fulfilled the condition is we get married right no i think that's right yeah i think once i think once they get married you can't it's done but then i don't know there's probably case law on annulment there i think that right. yeah. I think the florida case that i picked up was about how, who gets the engagement ring after a divorce which is of course right which leads me to believe that it was a very fresh um, <laughs> right. Like, does the was the condition really met, or or, yeah. or was it like kind of bullshit met? Yeah, yeah. And the trial court tried to split the difference by by just forcing a sale of the ring and giving them both half. And the appeals court said, no, he gets the ring. Sorry. <laughs> the, it, oh wait, he got the ring after a divorce. I think wow. so. Let's see. Uh, uh, no, they 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 remanded it to a finding for a finding fact on that. Um. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. They called this solution of selling the ring and giving it half and half uh, Solomon-esque, which I suppose <laughs> is true if you think. Wait, that, I mean, literally. Well, yes. it's literally <laughs> yes, except that a ring. Oh, I guess no. Yes. Solomon-esque would be chopping it in half. Right. Yes, but also again, the story of Solomon. It's a human child, not an expensive <laughs> ring, and I feel like there's a distinction there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, children are worth nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They're just money. Sets. Well, I mean, they, they might be worth two or three Bitcoin, actually, <laughs> in certain <laughs> corners of the web. <laughs> and so thanks, everyone, uh, for tuning in to the pilot episode of Mike Dicta, America's best named legal podcast, where we require you to figure out the fun. Sweetness and I like the dance. Running the ball is like Mickey Moe Mance. We had to go to training camp to give Chicago a Super Bowl champ. And we're not doing this because we're greedy. The Bears are doing it to feed the needy. We didn't come here to look for trouble. We just come here to do the Super Bowl shop. This is Steve Willis, and I'm world class. I like running, but I love to get the pass. I practice 
dance all day and dance all night. I gotta get ready for the Sunday fight. Now I'm as smooth as a chocolate swirl. I dance a little funky, so watch me, girl. There's no one here that does it like me. My Super Bowl shuffle will set you.